You're taking me somewhere to kill me. No, I'm taking you someplace to talk. Where I lie, I don't like to talk. But you do like to lie, which you just did. Because we both know you love to talk. Wow. Well, Loki, uh, it's been a long journey. <laughs> um, it's been, uh, I mean, technically, I think for, for audiences, it's been 10 years, but for me, it's been about 12 years since I first auditioned. I first auditioned um, in 2009 uh, uh, in the spring. As I think many people are aware, I auditioned for the role of Thor initially. Casting director Randy Hiller and um, Sarah Finn seemed to think that, you know, I was tall and blonde and and so I could try have a go. Um, but um, as everybody knows, uh, I came out of that process as Loki. And it was really interesting because I think even in the minds of, of everybody at Marvel Studios, both roles were still malleable. Obviously everyone knew who Thor and Loki were from the comics and from Norse mythology, but they wanted to find two actors who could play brothers and who were both a, a kind of a foil for each other and a match for each other. And they found uh, the great Chris Hemsworth, the mighty Thor himself, <laughs> and uh, and me. And um, it was an amazing time. It, you know, we were, I think, Kevin Feige and Kenneth Branagh called Chris five minutes before they called me and then got us together very quickly. And, and um, we met in the UK about a week after that, two weeks after that. Um, <clears throat> and we all hung out together and, and um, and it was the beginning of this extraordinary journey, which has changed both of our lives. And I remember that very, very well, because it had been quite a long um, process in the auditions and for both of us. And, and um, we kind of, at that point, didn't expect to get to, get to where we, we, we eventually got to. And um, they had announced, I think, that Anthony Hopkins would be playing Odin, our father, and that kind of, was, was something to get used to. Um, and Rene Rousseau playing uh, Frigga and Natalie Portman playing Jane Foster. And we just just felt like the two luckiest guys in the world. And at the beginning of a really long and unknown journey, which was really exciting. And it's always been nice to have him kind of a, a, alongside to sort of, you know, we both can't quite believe where we are. You know, it's been a, it's been a life-changing thing for sure. What is this newfound love for the Frost Giants? You could have killed them all with your bare hands. That changed. So have I. Now fight me. You know, that first film um, remains incredibly special uh, in my memory. It was a really, it was an extraordinary group of people, actually. Um, and and perhaps it's maybe it's my memory kind of filtering it with a kind of golden halo but but i really remember it as a as a very um we were all very aware of of it was a good script and they were and everybody involved was extremely talented and working kind of above and beyond their capacities to make this the best it could be um and that was across the board across the cast certainly um that Kenneth Branagh had this extraordinary vision of Asgard and the royal family at the center of it and these dynamics within quite a complex family that were very, felt very real, but also very um, appropriately heightened for this is the royal family and they govern the order of the universe. And so if things go wrong between fathers and sons or two brothers, it, the stakes are high because the, uh, because it matters. <laughs> um, and both Chris and I have talked about, we owe so much to Ken Branagh because he was such a, a kind and inspiring director for us as young actors, a brilliant actor's director. But also it was really his vision of Asgard. He built this world that we've played in for 10 years and, and set up the rules of it and the palace and the costumes and, um, his longtime collaborator Alex Byrne, who, who Alexandra Byrne, who made the costumes, um, working with concept artists who'd been at Marvel Studios 
uh, Charlie Wen and Ryan Minerding, who I remember walking into Alex's fitting room for the first time and she had these images which had been drawn by uh, Ryan or Charlie, uh, Charlie Wen or Ryan Minerding. And, and they were images of Thor and Loki, but with our faces on. And so it was kind of taking inspiration from different comic books and different runs of the comics from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They'd put their own spin on it. And Alex was saying, right, we have to bring that two dimensional picture into a 3D movie and um, see if we can make it work. Capes, helmets, breastplates, you know, the hammer, the staff, um, all these kind of I mean, knew we had to be able to fight in it and emote in it and act in it. And, and so it was an extraordinary journey towards that first moment of stepping into the costume. And a uh, production designer called Bo Welch, who built Asgard, who built the Royal Palace, and um, our director of photography, Harris Zambalukos, who's worked a lot with Kenneth Branagh. Um, and so many of the choices we made in that first film have, have they've had a long, They've cast a long shadow across all the films about, um, specifically about that central triangle about Odin, Thor, and Loki. And the dynamic between them really, a, a very kind of relatable story about fathers and sons and brothers and Loki obviously feeling instinctively isolated and not understanding why. And then finding out in fact that he was adopted and that suddenly all, all sorts of things making sense to him about his childhood and him feeling very betrayed and angry and 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 um upset and and sad and lonely and then that all that sort of fragmenting the relationship with thor and then they kind of go off in different directions and and that's a big moment for both of them enough you are all of you beneath me I am a god, you dull creature, and I will not be bullied by that. Yeah, it was so fun. I mean, Loki is a character who's been around for thousands of years. And he was in the, you know, ancient Norse myths, and he's been in um, various, you know, in he turns up in opera and in theater and in literature and and then he turns up in the marvel comics in the 60s and stan lee makes him the antagonist in the thor in the thor run and he has such amazing range because he is mischievous and playful and witty and charismatic and charming and fun but he's also broken and damaged and vulnerable and jealous and he's full of grievance and a kind of um, unprocessed pain and anger and the cocktail of those things the wit and the charm and the vulnerability and the um and the grievance and you just shake it up and you have this really this character who can ch change shape and he's, he's the shapeshifter the trickster somebody who's transgressive and disruptive who ex exists on this line between good and bad and that was my entry point for Avengers. Um, was I knew that I felt very lucky that in the way Loki had been written in Thor by uh, Don Payne, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, had so much pathos that I thought if I can put a shell around the pathos and um, and put a bit of uh, put some stakes in it. You know, he's someone who now understands who he is. And I knew the structure of the film was such that the movie's called Avengers and the Avengers are the good guys. <laughs> and if the film's gonna work, they need a bad guy and that was gonna be me. And and so to really lean into the the my position as the antagonist. But still, so he was, you know, he's playing this game of chess. He's trying to um, kind of outwit and outsmart every Avenger. He gets a one, he gets a kind of one-on-one -on -one with everybody. Um, and because he's so clever and so um, manipulative, he kind of turns them against each other, which is why they're, 
they're, they're kind of disparate in the, in the first and second act of that film. But then they unite to stop him. And I realized there had to be something quite kind of purely villainous about Loki in that film. Um, because for the film to work, you know, you want to, you hopefully cheer when he loses. And he does. <laughs> he gets his, uh, I think it's his right foot, gets grabbed by the Hulk and he gets smashed around like a rag doll. And, and, and that's the end of Loki, really. There's no, no coming back after that. You must be truly desperate to come to me for help. What makes you think you can trust me? I don't. Mother did. So, yeah, Thor The Dark World, um, we, we made that quite shortly after Avengers uh, was released. And so we, Chris and I came into that experience kind of very fresh off the back of Avengers. And um, I knew that Loki was going to be this very different. He wasn't going to be the main villain. That was going to be Malekith, played by Christopher Eccleston. And Loki's function in the story was was as a kind of wingman, in a way, to Thor, that they form based around the grief that they feel uh, because of the death of their mother. They have to form a, a very a, a spontaneous and unstable alliance. And they're united by their, their shared grief and they want to, to stop the Dark Elves from um, accomplishing their mission to return the universe to darkness. Um, and there was such a fun quality to the dynamic between Thor and Loki because all of that, their sort of um, prehistory as brothers and they have a kind of playful, fractious, teasing relationship comes out in that film. And I knew in the script there was a moment where um, Thor and Loki are stranded on the dark world, quite literally, the home of the dark elves, Svartalfheim. Uh, and with Jane Foster, played by Natalie Portman, um, and they, in, in a battle with the dark elves, um, it becomes very dangerous for both of them. And um, they are they lose they are losing in a in a one on one sort of skirmish and they're surrounded, and Thor is taking um, a a very substantial and very painful beating from uh, Algrim or Curse, and that Loki somehow, in some change of heart or extraordinary act of courage decides to help his brother uh, and and distract um, Algrim or Curse so that for a moment Thor can get back on his feet. And in so doing, actually is mortally wounded and sacrifices himself. And uh, it was written as a very poignant moment because Loki is untrustworthy and mercurial and you're never quite sure what his motivations are and Thor is constantly questioning whether he can trust his brother and he probably can't but in this one moment Loki seems to have made an unselfish altruistic generous act but it's cost him his life and I remember thinking this is a big moment this is going to be this is the end of Loki finally you realize he does love his brother and he certainly loves his mother and he maybe even loves his father um, but they never got to uh, bury the hatchet um, and, and make peace. And we played the death scene as completely sincere. It was goodbye. It was goodbye to Loki. It was goodbye for me. Um, I remember it was a big day on set and um, people were really, really generous and sensitive about it. And we played it, you know, for real. And um, Chris, I remember, gave a very like moving performance as well. And and um, I thought, okay, that's it. That's the end of that's the end of Loki. And then uh, we wrapped on principal photography and 
months went by and I think uh, a good six months actually. And then I got a call from Kevin Feige saying, you know, Loki was, you know, supposed to die. Well, we have tested the film and um, in test screenings, people, the first thing people said was, well, well where's Loki? And, um, and they said, and we said, well, you, you know, you saw what happened. He, uh, he makes the sacrifice play and, and that's it. And they went, well, obviously he just, he's not really dead. And they went, uh, you know, maybe, 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 I think he, I think he maybe is. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and, and the audience says, well, obviously we don't believe that. They just didn't accept that Loki was really dead. They thought he'd somehow find some spontaneous trick or, 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 or way of getting out of it. And it was a kind, it was, it made them all scratch their heads at Marvel Studios and think, um, right, okay, we better rethink this. And then that's how they came up with the, the new ending, which is that, um, Loki had faked his own death and was now and had shapeshifted into an Asgardian guard and was now impersonating Odin sitting on the throne, which then led us into the beginning of Ragnarok, where it's Loki pretending to be Odin and he's pretended to be Odin for quite a long time, um, uh, which is quite the spell to keep up, um, quite the trick for the trickster. Uh, and um, it became a really fun new way to end the film and begin the next one. So, yeah, it was bizarre. And so we, and, and um, you know, an ending is just a new beginning. He let's do Get Help. What? Get Help. No. Come on, you love it. I hate it. It's great. It works every time. It's humiliating. Do you have a better plan? No. We're doing it. We are not doing Get Help. Well, what I've really enjoyed most of all is is that complexity is is his place in his place at the table of the gods has always been occupying a position of unpredictability and chaos and spontaneity. And the, across the stories of Loki from thousands of years ago, the most interesting aspect for me is that he was someone the gods the other gods, Odin, Thor, Frigga, they had to sort of put up with and endure because he was unstable and treacherous and you couldn't quite trust him. And he was sometimes chaotic in an unhelpful way. And then occasionally necessary. And when everybody else had run out of ideas, it was Loki's idea that was a bit out of left field, unconventional, but might be the thing that we need and might be the thing that saves us in the end. And I've always been drawn to this idea that Loki's chaos is occasionally something we need, that not everything can be ordered and sometimes, and everything can be planned and prepared and, and done by the book. But like Loki somehow as this unpredictable spirit, there's somebody who crosses boundaries and questions everything and changes shape and has a kind of a wit and an intelligence and lots of different cards to play is something that is once, you know, once in a blue moon, useful. That's what I've loved about Loki, is that you're never quite sure what his motivations are. You're never quite sure if, his, if he's being sincere and you don't know if you can trust him or not. And that I think, I hope, audiences can see that there is good in him. There always was. And there are also these other instincts that are drawn towards um, something less virtuous, but there he, he, he himself is, is a cocktail of all these ingredients. That, you know, perhaps he's not truly good and he's not truly bad. He's somewhere in the middle and um, I think I, f I find that just a very complex, interesting part to play. Um, because let's not forget, he's also the god of mischief. And mischief in itself is, I once looked it up in the dictionary because I was really curious and it's I like an inclination to playfulness. And I thought, what a wonderful thing to inhabit, a character whose inclination is playful. And sometimes playfulness is about, you know, stepping outside the box, I guess.
What I love about Loki in this show is it's the Loki you know in a world you don't know. And Loki's someone who's always been very controlled, always been someone who's quite confident in the cards he's got in his hand and which cards he's going to play. And, and the series, Loki, puts Loki in a position where he is out of control, out of his comfort zone, um, and a fish out of water. And that's very confronting for him. You, you take away his status, you take away his magic, you take away his power, his costume, the context that he's familiar with, his brother, Asgard, his father, all the things he's used to. And you put him in this new context of the TVA, the Time Variance Authority, who are a bureaucratic organization tasked with ordering time, making sure that reality unfolds according to predetermined decisions. So you have this massive institution that represents order, and you have this mercurial spirit who represents chaos. And that's where our show starts. <laughs>